New, new age plant. Yeah, basically. Okay. This is Mr. James Gibson's so mojo. Where That's where he keeps it. Similar inside of there. Yeah. Okay. That, that is point. Keep close eye on that. Which is just wood ash. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Hey, welcome back. I am Jason Salyer, and this is James Gibson. James Gibson, and James Gibson is um, somebody that I really, really look up to, and I think of him as a mentor at this point. And he's he's got um, you've got something about you. You've got oh, something you. that that I'm drawn to, <laughs> and I don't really know how to describe it, but uh, but um, I, I'm drawn to you because of your I guess the energy that you put out. You're excited mm. about life, and I it is, and I and I. <laughs> I really yeah. like being around people like that. I feel like I hope I'm one of those people, and I try to be one of those you people. Are. Um, you are. I've noticed that about you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but 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 basically, um, if you could tell the people that are watching a little bit about yourself and your background and and why we're here, kind of thing. Okay, we're at the farm at Randall's Invention Training, SC Knife Company, and I've been affiliated with them for ten years. This this class we're finishing tomorrow will be ten years of teaching the bushcraft survival classes. I'm a knife designer. They have four of my designs that they sell and which I receive a royalty on as well. I designed the Gibson Axe, the JG5 for exclusively for Smoky Mountain Knife Works. I designed the JG3, which is the first knife they put out. And I also designed the little knife called the Pinch that will do in a pinch. So it's kind of a cute little knife, but it actually handles like a bigger knife the way I worked on it and designed it. So anyway, uh, I've been with them a long time now, and, and I've been making knives since 1980. Actually, it was the last of 79, but it's easier to keep up with it from 1980 to this point. I'll be, uh, next month, I'll be 68 years old, and I've had a wonderful life. I've, I'm a flint napper, I build bowls, I'm a spoon carver, teach classes and all this stuff. I carve the wooden cooks us, and uh, just do a host of, things it's hard for me to describe everything i do if you see my shop you'd understand that too <laughs> so but anyway uh we're finishing up a class here tomorrow the advanced bushcraft class here and be the last one for the year then i've got some classes that, that i've got to teach later for the baptist bushcraft group and stuff like that but it's great meeting jason he's a great guy enjoyed meeting him i met you i think at uh was it uh the fall, not the uh, at the Georgia Bushcraft, the co-op campfire co-op campfire co-op. Camp co yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's first. I'd seen your stuff, and there's, but that's the first time I met you. And he's he's into it. He's really active with those things too. And I like seeing that out of most people. Uh, like I said before, I'm I'm drawn to people that are energetic and excited about what they do, yeah. and they're they're doing what they love to do. Right. Um, and I think that's super important. And I was just curious, when you wake up in the morning, is there do you have a plan or is it just yes okay <laughs> what is it uh this is kind of funny but uh when i roll out my feet hit the floor and everything is popping a creak and a crack i'm gonna wait first if it's gonna fall off <laughs> if it doesn't then i'll make a move and get but as i'm sitting there i thank the lord that i've slept, had a wonderful night's sleep i thank him that he's blessed me with another day of life and i say lord help me to utilize this and use this day to the best of my ability and be a witness to someone that might make a difference in their life. And then I have the plan, usually it's go to the shop and I keep constant orders of knives. I think I'm down to 50 something orders right now. And I think at the end of last year, I had 128 orders and I've whittled them down quite a bit. He's, he's when he says he makes knives, he doesn't just make knives, you make works of art that are also very functional, practical tools. Thank you. Um, and they're, they're top-notch tools. Where, uh, let me see your folder real quick. We'll show it to the camera. Uh, get, it, get it out. Yeah, fish it out. Friction folder, Japanese Higo Mama. So here's just, here's just one small example of something that James makes. Piece of art right there. What was the name of your, the pattern on the blade? Uh, what was it, Thaw, freeze thaw? Freeze thaw. Freeze thaw. Freeze -thaw. <laughs> it had frozen that night, and I seen it on the road, and it was thawing out to the edges, and it left that pattern. So I took a picture of it and went home, and I drew it up, and then I think the first knife I put it on, Rick Stowe, a friend of mine, he also writes for Overland Road Shows and stuff like that, and he got the first one I ever made, yeah. the freeze thaw pattern. But yeah, it's a, it's a cool knife, and they're useful and handy. And uh, if you make it with antler, they call it a mountain man fishing folder. 
but uh, this is a Japanese version of a higonami. I think that's a short way of saying that big long word. It's not that long. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. Yeah, but you but, make pretty amazing things. So you've done a lot of things with blacksmithing, uh, knife making. Yes. I'm a journeyman bladesmith in the a ABS American Bladesmith Society. I trained under J Dr. Jim Batson. and he's my mentor, and he's a retired rocket scientist. He was also the chairman or the president of the ABS uh, two times. He's really my mentor. I've been making knives before I went, but I went to get formal training, and that was in uh, 91 or two, I think. But I seek out all kinds of makers. A lot of them didn't have time to fool with you in education. Somebody would show you a little something. But I would glean everything that I could. And But I decided once, uh, one guy, gentleman told me, named Paul Pop, and he'd made moccasins and stuff, and he made a few knives. He said, why don't you go to the blade school and just learn it all? And I said, I'll do that. Just, so I I'll purposed in my heart to do that. <laughs> it's just like when I, I've been in uh, martial arts since I was 14 years old. I quit and I was 63. I'll be 68 next month. And uh, I went to Japan, trained with Hatsumi Sensei. But I, I always wanted to do something like that. And uh, we was at a, uh, we had a visiting uh, fellow from Japan teaching down in Atlanta. So we go down in the back of the group and everything. And uh, I was talking to Jack Hoban, and my teacher was, and Jack said, people talk about going here and going there. He said, if they don't purpose to do that, they'll never do it. I thought to myself, Senator Tyler, he is right. I said, I'm gonna go to Japan. And I was single at the time, but I had, uh, time it rolled around, we got to go. I had gotten remarried, and we'd been married maybe a year. So I was gone for a month, and that was, you know, my wife is very understanding still to this day. She is the absolute love of my life, my best friend. The green-eyed darling. The green-eyed darling, that's what <laughs> we call her. And Brian said he was going to call his wife that uh, something like that. I said, no, you're not. I've had that name yeah, for her for you years. Yeah, can't take it. But he calls his the mean-eyed darling. Laughs <laughs> <laughs> right, about it. That's but, pretty uh, good. Yeah, and he's talking about uh, doing things you like. If you do, they, I've always heard this. If you get a job that you like, you'll never work a day in your life. I've worked my rear end. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I actually, uh, I always thought I'd like to be a general contractor. And so I've become a general contractor. Got licensed and everything, built several houses mm -hmm. on the lake up in Danridge, Tennessee there. I'm, I'm from East Tennessee. I grew up in the foothills of the Great Smoky Mountains. Love the area, I always have. No matter where I've gone, look at beautiful places out west, the Grand Canyon and Canada and all these places, nothing like home. They say, there's a saying said, you can take the boy out of the mountains, but you can't take the mountains out of the boy. And that's true. And that's me. That's you. That's me. Um, do you want to talk at all about upbringing? Anything like that? Sure. Oh, you, you, had a, you had kind of a rough upbringing at points in time, so right? I, I did, yeah. yeah. And I, I maybe okay. told too much last night. But no, <laughs> but, but, but you don't have to tell all that, but maybe... Did that sculpt who you kind of are in some of the tenacity and the... Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. Start with, uh, I'm from a family of eight children. My mother miscarried a set of twins, and she didn't know what gender, if it was male or female. It's not like it's all this new stuff going on. Uh, everybody knew if it was a boy or a girl back in those days, you know. And uh, uh, anyway, I'm just, I'm just plain, folks. I'm just very plain about things. Uh, anyway... Uh, I was the second oldest. I had an older brother. I was the second oldest, then a sister, then a brother, then four more sisters. I have five sisters and two brothers. And I always wondered what the twin mom miscarried would have been boy or girl. Been bad if it had been more girls. <laughs> you know. You'd know, you have been surrounded. Yeah. <laughs> and my dad was a very rough man. He grew up rough. His mother died when he was two years old. He was raised by stepmothers and things and make him sleep outside. And his dad worked him like a borrowed mule. Uh, logging, they log for a living. That's how I learned about axes, chainsaws, stuff. Dad would still do a little logging in between jobs sometimes and stuff. And uh, what's funny about when I was born on November the 27th, 1954, my mother said it was one of the coldest days she can remember. And because uh, she was lived at the hospital a few days later and seen the record temperature and all. And when my dad had been out of work and he come to get us, and he had, uh, I believe he had $60. The bill was $100 back then when I was born. And uh, he had $60. And uh, he was going to tell the nurse that I've got $60 I'm going to pay you. He, she said, you'll have to talk to the head nurse. So he goes down and he said, that was the crabbiest, hateful woman he'd ever seen in his life. And uh, so she said, uh, she said, $60, you've had nine months to get this up. 
He said, I've had to provide for my family and work. It's hard to find at that time and everything. And uh, she made him mad, and he just walked out, and he said, you keep them for the bill. <laughs> <laughs> he started walking down the hall, and a nurse come running down there to him. Said, Mr. Gibson, said, she's going to take it at $60. He said, said, I'm just giving 20 now. <laughs> he gave $20. The price has just I don't changed. know if he ever paid the rest of her or not. Mom wouldn't talk to him for about a week. Wow. <laughs> she owed everything going on. Wow. So, but anyway, um, my dad, like I say, is a rough man. He's in the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. He joined the Army at 16 years old. Hmm. Get away from home. He paid a stranger on the street to sign him in. So anyway, um, I grew up around that, and my grandfather was married seven times and fathered 23 children. Wow. And a lot of them had been in the penitentiary or something like that, and our family had a bad name. I can remember going over the boys' houses, and their mother come out and said, you Gibson boys need to go home. And so we'd go home, you know, and what do you do, you know? But me and my two brothers, and my, when my dad got right with the Lord, and he started preaching got right. and all this. He got right. <laughs> so, uh, he sure did. They made bets on the highway because he, he drank a lot in them days and stuff too before he got right. And uh, that he was pulling some kind of a con or something, you know. But he wasn't. He got the real thing. He actually got right. Yeah, he actually got no, right, man. He wasn't faking it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so anyway, uh, both my brothers became preachers. And I'm just a lay member. I play guitar and my wife and I sing in church and love what we do. I got right, you know, some years later. My dad walked the hallways and stuff after uh, he got right and I wasn't. And uh, cause I was still going to the Beer Jones White Shop pool games where him betting on it and everything like that when I was 16 years old. Mm -hmm. And so I was raised up and stuff like that. Then I had a cousin that moved down from Chicago and he introduced me to marijuana. The year between the eighth grade and freshman in high school. And that, that kind of, Changed my life Set quite you a bit. Set you on a different path. It did. <laughs> and it took a long time till I was 24 years old. And uh, I got saved. A New Year's Eve night. And it's not been the same since for me. I know we're going in, a lot of people don't like to talk about religion, but it's important to me. A lot of people don't like to talk about politics, but somebody has to care. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to care and put their foot down. That's enough. Let's do. Let's change this or whatever. But uh, yeah, it was it was rough. I was mostly on my own from like 17 years old on, you know, mm -hmm. and it's things like that. And uh, anyway, I didn't finish high school. I quit my junior year and went to work. I ended up uh, being a, owning a roofing company and contracted with Sears all the time. I ended up becoming a uh, home improvement contractor, got a license for that. Then I ended up becoming a full-blown general contractor. Mm -hmm. But I kind of worked for my uncle in his cabinet shop, and I learned a lot about wood. I had a love for wood. And so I still carve and, and make benches and stools, you know, peg the legs and everything. But uh, making knives has always been a love of mine, and making stone knives before I flint and have to do that. But a knife, I tell, tell Jason earlier, is my piece of canvas that I can bring out art in. But I want a functional piece of art that will work. Right. Yeah. Anybody can just slap some paint on a piece of canvas. Yeah. But what does it do? Exactly. <laughs> Your piece yeah. of art does something. If you paint a horse, you don't look like he's really running. <laughs> you know, things like that. That's right. We have, we've had a lot of fun and great times. When I get started going, sometimes I, I talk too much. <laughs> as I'm demoing, I'm talking about, I told them yesterday about the, in 1780, October the 14th, was the most decisive battle fought in the Revolutionary War. That's when they cornered Ferguson on King's Mountain. That battle, Ferguson made a statement, he said, God himself and all the rebels of hell cannot move me off this mountain. And they killed him and buried him there. I won't go in about the proclamation. The piss proclamation. The piss proclamation. <laughs> um, they cornered him there and they killed Ferguson there. He had invented a revolving rifle. And if that had caught on, they'd had superior firepower, but I don't believe God was in it. He wanted this nation to be founded. This is the first real Christian nation. I know the Jewish people are God's chosen people, and I understand that, and we should back them and support them 100%. But uh, for as Christian nations, America has been the shining beacon around the world. Mm -hmm. How many people have we helped? What have we done? Of course, our nation is going away from that. It's going down. I'm not, I'm not going to get into that. So we won't go there. <laughs> That's a whole different video. I get on a soapbox. It's a whole different video. Um, you can edit this stuff, huh? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. uh, so, 
why survival? Like, wh- why do you teach survival? Why why are you interested in primitive skills? What's the deal? What? Why that? Okay. When I was young, I often thought, how do they make a fire? If you, how long would your matches last? Because we just had box stick matches. The big lighter didn't come out. What was it? Seventy two or seventy three? Oh wow! Really? The first disposable lighter was yeah. the big lighter. They had the old zip holes and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, that's and right. And if you run run out of a piece of flint for it or if you run out of alco- uh, lighter fluid, you're just out, you're just out of the den. You know, I thought, how'd they do that? I'd like to know these mm-hmm. things. And it was years. I was just a young boy, and I'd read every book I could get. I read about Custer. I read about uh, all these famous generals, and I read about these famous Indians like uh, Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce. I, I, he's an admirable man. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, a lot of them were, of course, anyway, Crazy Horse and all those guys. And uh, But I wanted to know how they did their lifestyle, so I tried to find every book I could read on it. I had about a half of a Boy Scout manual. and uh, Half of one? Uh, half of one. I, did, I didn't have a whole book. It had been torn apart, oh. and I had that. So I utilized that, and I learned a little bit about fire lays and stuff like that when my mom wasn't whooping me through starting fires. And I was probably a little young, but I needed some instruction. But my dad had a group of friends that could do a lot of stuff. One made a few pocket knives. One of them could work wood like you wouldn't believe. And then he had an uncle named, uh, well, I forgot his name. I'll, it'll come to him in a minute. But I got with him and started going with him, Sane, and that's called Sane of his digging ginseng. And he'd pull out a plant here and say, you can use this for that, use this for this. But I was young. I didn't let it absorb in like I should have. But I was digging that ginseng because that was profitable. And I didn't have canteens, nothing. I had a fruit jar. Well, the string tried around the deck of it, and that's what I carried my water. And if you broke it, you was out of water. And you'd be drinking out of one of the springs in the mountains there, you know. And they'd say, no, we're going to be on some posted land. Don't talk. And he said if it was, <laughs> the underbrush was kind of, you know, thick in some areas and the laurels growing and stuff like that. And you would want to uh, get uh, get across that land. And he said, don't talk. But he told me, if you make your digging stick, you get you a piece of hickory about four or five foot tall, Take your piece of pipe and fit on it, put a nail through it and hammer that pipe, and it looks like the end of a, a flat screwdriver, and you dig with that. So, but if you get, we get away from it, he said, just rack on a tree. He said, that sound carries, and you, they would rack on a tree, and you said, you come toward the sound. They broke off the top of a ginseng, they give it to me, said, get anything that looks like this, it's got four prongs. If it's a great big three prong, get that, but I always plant the berries back. That's how they done things, so it, but the crop would continue mm-hmm. on. But uh, I wanted to know these things, so I, I started pursuing it early in my life. And uh, then later, I, I found out about Tom Brown. I went to Tom Brown's class. I trained with uh, Steve Watts, which has been my, by far my most favorite instructor. He passed away a few years back. And uh, I went and we tra- trained with uh, Boris Kohansky, which was a phenomenal trip. I trained, I, I like Scott Jones, he's an archaeologist. I've trained with Scott Jones some. And I trained a lot of different individuals when I got into flint napping. They'd be teaching something at a napping. And I'd say, hey man, I don't want to learn that. So I'd sit in and learn it. I got involved in brain tanning, bow building. I've got a lot of friends that do these things too, besides just knife making. Uh, I do a host of things, as you say, right. you know, this weekend. But uh, I guess I just got into it because as a boy, I wanted to be an Indian. Mm hmm. I, I didn't care about being a mountain man. I wanted to be an Indian for some reason. And we do have the Cherokee blood in our family line. It don't show up in me because we're of the Viking race that migrated into Scotland and become part of the Clan Buchanan. David Gibson come to America in the 1700s and fought in the Battle of Kings Mountain. Uh-huh. One of land grant in Gastonia. But uh, I just want to know more, and I'm ever the student. I don't care if I'm teaching a class. If I see a student doing something different than the way I do it, They've not been told, hey, you don't do it this way. They go ahead and do it, and they learn from that, mm-hmm. and I learn from that, mm-hmm. you know. And I want to ever be the student. Yeah. And uh, But uh, I, I don't know what else to really say about survival, but uh, I just love it. Bushcraft also, which bushcraft, they, there's a difference between the two. Mm-hmm. Bushcraft is crafting in the bush. We Everybody adds primitive skills in it most of the time primitive fire making, yeah. hand drill, bow drill, when it really should just be like flint and steel during that time, move up into modern to ferro rod. But I want to learn all those skills regardless. I've always taught you need three means to start a fire, a big lighter, a ferro rod, 
the matches that will light and burn underwater and all this stuff. You want some way to protect yourself. And you want to carry things in the wintertime, like the little fire starters when the wax and all that too, in which we make that stuff. But uh, And then have all those skills to boot, because if you lose your bag, that's why another thing like survival, how to work stone to make a cutting tool. How to make you know how to make a fire without mm -hmm. any means just gather it out in the woods and, you, you, and that's good practice you know what i like about it i think is it's the problem solving right so you you know if things go wrong or you don't have what you need you can still solve the problem exactly. in some way you make do and you've got the mental tools yep. to do that and I, I, that's what i appreciate it most. yes and uh, adversity and uh, necessity is the greatest inventor mm -hmm. i've had problems on knife things and i just kept thinking what can i do Finally, I get an idea, and I'll go with it, and it'll work. Sometimes mm -hmm. it don't. But uh, uh, necessity is a great inventor. Mm -hmm. It is, probably of all. I've mentioned the Lord. I always try to do that. When you got right, you yeah, got right. got right, man. <laughs> if you don't know what got right means, it means you, you found religion. Yes. <laughs> they, like they used to say in the old days, they say, he got religion. He got religion. Yeah, that's he right. he got religion. Or it he found got you. right and got religion. It usually finds you. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Anyway, it mean, means you changed your life for the better, and you've devoted your life to Christ to be a better person. That's yes. you got right. And anyway, uh, okay, cool. How can um, how can people find you? Uh, I'm on uh, Instagram. I'm Knob Creek Forge Fifty Four. That's K N O B Creek C R E E K Forge F O R G E Fifty Four on Instagram. Then I have the James Gibson page on Facebook. I'm easy to get a hold of. Uh, I've had so many orders for so long. It's it's kind of you know I've been retired for a couple of years, and I've been busier you know with honeydews and stuff too. And uh, so I'm going to uh, probably quit taking orders for a while and uh, get caught up. And I might just start making to sell them online because I had some that some people couldn't take, and I they sold in 21 minutes. <laughs> I could sold 30 if I'd had them done. Yeah. You know? So. Uh, anyway all right well great um well thank you very much guys i really really appreciate you watching make sure you hit the thumbs up subscribing if you haven't done so already uh check out mr gibson look him up and uh i can't wait to see you on the next one great thank you very much <laughs>